afternoon. Thank you very much for being accurate. Well, so I will only briefly introduce her, saying that we are very pleased to have a, her as a Lumni Award winner of this year for her remarkable impact and also the entrepreneurial lady that she is. And we have to remember that she works intensively to expand access to water, sanitation and hygiene in related services. She has launched a sanitation program at Mary University of Science and Technology in Kenya. She also established the university's Sanitation Research Institute and since 2021 serves as a director. She is involved in efforts to promote this site, the citywide inclusive sanitation in Africa. She has founded an organization that seeks to promote the well-being of underprivileged women and girls. And with that, I give the floor to Shoi. Thank you very much for this presentation that will be recorded. Shoi, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much, Maria. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> so thank you very much. I'm giving you a presentation here. I said I work in promoting sanitation. So whatever I'm showing you here is the actual status in my country, what I'm really dealing with, and I have a suggested solution that I've tried to implement to show that to show people that it is actually possible. So definitely in the 21st century we'll be fighting over water. We'll be fighting over water because most of the countries now are water scarce and whatever is there is contaminated. So what do we really have to do to save the situation? For the, the contamination of the water sources, the key contributing factor is population growth. In Kenya we have a 2.28 percentage, per, that is per annum growth in population. So when we have this uh, population growth, we have contamination. Contamination of water bodies comes into play. This is because of uh, sometimes poor management, institutional management. When we look at the, what is happening to our water catchment areas, is a lot of degradation. Still there is a lot of uh, dis unequal distribution. You find the rich are having a lot of water, the poor don't have water. If it's there, it's contaminated. Riparian zones are also encroached. And then it all brings all that summation and contributing to global warming. When you look at this population growth, how do it normally impact on our water bodies? The water, as we increase, as uh, the population adds, the water requirements, we need more water to sustain this population. We also eat more. When we eat more, we use more water, we release more water. When we eat more, we release a lot of waste. So it's like the more we increase in population, the more the waste that we produce. That's why I have uh, highlighted, I've uh, put that waste generation in green. There's more waste being produced. We must be prepared to deal with this waste which is being generated. When this waste generate, is generated and it's not handled well, then you have a lot of sanitation related illnesses, which brings in poverty. Because the little money that was there is spent in hospitals. When there is poverty, then you have people like who are moving to towns are getting to certain slums because that is the only places they can afford. So at the end of the day, we have these very many slums within the city centers which really can't be managed. And not unless you think about how to deal with that population which is settling there or how to save our water bodies, then we are going to have a very big issue. With all this, you're putting a very high pressure on the infrastructure that is already existing. So many of the governments are not in a position to, to deal with this population, to provide more of the social amenities and basic infrastructure. So I have a slide here on contribution, contamination of water bodies. How do we have water bodies being contaminated? Quite a number of ways. Poor waste, poor sanitation, this is in real, I, poor sanitation there, I refer to our waste. Or solid waste management, poor. They also increased agricultural activities. Remember when we increase in population, farmers have to do more work. 
These activities are utilizing a lot of fertilizers. When it rains, all this is being sold into water bodies. And also there's also the aspect of industrialization. Whatever I have here is a case of Nairobi River, which is passing through the informal slum settlements in Nairobi. This Nairobi River calendry is feeding a dam which is being constructed, which is called the Dwarken Dam, which is a 82 billion Kenya shilling project, a huge investment. But as it is, it's being said it might be a white elephant. White elephant, why? If you look at this water, this is actually flowing sewage. If you pass by this river, you have to close the nose because it's smelling. This area is surrounded by industries and also there are the slums. And for these slums, the waste is released directly into this particular river. So it doesn't matter what you do if something is not done to avoid this type of pollution. If this river here was saved, the population in slums would be saved. This is the water we are saying it's available, but just in, in you can see it, but you can't use it. But if it can be saved, it can be act as a source of water for the population who are around that area. So this one here, I've given a case of Kenya, but sanitation is basically a global issue. Kenya, where I come from, these figures here I got through an interview which I conducted something in May. I asked, I, I will be doing a publication on this because they are, they are not, results which are not yet reported. So in this you ask, uh, what, what's the sanitation coverage? This is in Nairobi. What's the sanitation coverage? The person doesn't want to tell you but tells you 27 percent in Nairobi. And 27 includes the sewer and the non sewer 27 percent. What about the water coverage? With a lot of power and confidence, 65% and tells you, if all goes well, by the end of this year we'll get 75%, which is a very good thing. We need water. Water is life. But then, when we think about, we are giving water to the population in Nairobi, all of them are 75% covered, but sewer range, the sewers there may be around 10%. When we take this water, 80% will be released as wastewater. Where will this wastewater go? We have the infrastructure to handle this type of water. So what will be happening is this wastewater will just be released to the environment. Maybe in 10 years time, we'll be having a road which is like a, like a wetland. Because this is where we have all the sewer. And then the clean water, this 75%, the pipes are passing along this. So you find even if it's clean water, it has already been contaminated. So there are all those uh, factors to consider. This this is a place. These are places that I'm working with. This is a uh, this is in Kibera Slum in Nairobi. The slum, the sanitation chain. What we call the sanitation service mm -hmm. chain. You know we normally think about the containment, emptying, transport, treatment, and disposal or reuse. But when you look at this, it's actually shrink complete. A, that's a toilet. That's a man in a toilet. B, that's a hand cut. When you look at C, they are transporting for disposal. That is Nairobi River. D, they are pouring. And the E, this is now the river. On the farthest end, which I can point around here, these are women here who are washing sacks to put the vegetables to take to the market. When I go to the market, I really not know who had, who, whose vegetables are contained in what type of bags. So that's why I'm asking here, who is safe? There's nobody who is safe. These people here are not safe, and we may not, we may not assume they are the only ones who are not safe. In one way or the other, their actions there will directly come to the plate for the bottle of water that you're holding onto. This is this are uh, this is what happens within the slums. Emptying of the waste there is manual by manual pit emptiers. So if you hear about manual pit emptiers, these are not stories. This is what normally happens. This is actually the reality.
So you can imagine, like I was asking what happens if a child comes and jump. And he says, they know about it. Nobody will come around this place. That is how they do the emptying. And now here they're washing. They're empty, we just wash them. Below this stream somewhere, there are some vegetables which are being grown. <laughs> <laughs> Think about how these people can be helped because they play a very key role in helping remove, at least remove, create a space in those pits. If they don't remove that waste, then there's a challenge. So there's a lot which needs to be thought about these particular people here. This one, in a, it was in a study which I was doing when I was uh, doing my PhD, actually the first time I started. I was looking at how do they empty, how do they transport, and how do, do they dispose. In this area, all the waste is manually emptied, like I've shown you, but the disposal varies. There are those who put it in a river. There are those who have, that's a irrigal manhole. There are those who will use that in irregular manhole, and there are those who will just put by the drain. There are others who have constructed very nice toilets. They are elevated, but by the drainage, you have a hole at the bottom. So when you use the toilet, you add water and it's sweet. Openification, but in a different way. Waste disposal, this is something that was done in May. This is in Korogotu Slam in Nairobi. The, f the picture I have here, this, this is what I was talking about, having some pipes at the bottom of your pit latrines, so that the waste flows directly. That's a girl there, that's how they dispose the wastewater. You have nowhere to put this, so immediately you're done, you put it. And basically they're girls, they're girls. That's a flat, the first one, that's a flat. That's how any wastewater generated from a flat will be handled directly into the drainage out there. Then for the electricity supply, there are a lot of cartels who are in this particular field. But the risk here and how electricity, poor solid waste management and uh, wastewater management come into play. When I look at the first one, I have a pipe. The pipe that I have here, this is electricity. This is an electric pipe, which is passing over that. So you normally hear about very many cases of uh, electrocution if you made a mistake of stepping on that water and there's something wrong with that pipe, you just die. There are a lot of fires still in slums because of such issues. That's why you find women feel more secure if you leave your children out and then in a field. 
because in a house there is a possibility of a fire outbreak or such a thing. This is how the electricity is distributed. But then there is also a challenge. The government in 2020 decided to help these people and installed tokens in the houses. What happened? Cartel, that cartel. Cartel, powerful individuals will go and remove these token meters and hook. This, this is how they hook. There are those who earn a living by that. So if you come with this intervention of helping these people, then I will not have my livelihood. So they will go remove the meters and take back, which is a bit cheaper. So this is what normally happens with electricity. Domestic water supply, this is also a very big issue. But the key thing here, it's on, you will not find a man with a jerry can going to look for water. They are only women and girls. The main challenge with having girls is they are normally exploited. Because a girl will go, maybe the queue is a bit long, someone will excuse me, bypass the line, and right in and help me carry this water to my house. But at the end of the day, I will return a favor. This person will not go back before he gets into the house. This is how these girls are normally exploited and a very bad thing. When we look at the pipes, this is a pipe here, this is a water pipe. These are water pipes. So when you talk to them, they tell you, our oh, water smells like sewage. But yes, you can tell them, yes, all those are rubber bands which are trying to fix leaking points. There's a lot of leakage. So instead of these people taking this clean water, then it's just smelling sewage. The one that I have here, this is a water kiosk. The government contracted somebody within the slum to supply water. This is the Nairobi Water and Sewerage Company. So they wanted to give these people some clean drinking water. So they come and contract someone like me to start a, a kiosk. I buy water from them at a cheap price so that they can now be able to sell to the people at the normal price. But then because I need more money, they have boreholes which have been drilled in these areas. I really like this event, there's a borehole which is there. That is just sheet water from those boreholes. So because that one is free, I will go and get to that water, I come and sell to the people in this particular kiosk. So you find that there are challenges. There might be some little efforts to help, but there are still challenges because of also of the issue of the cartels that are there. Then the other thing that I found quite needy is do we even think about these people, the vulnerable population among the, this community? So you will see overall, you say they are all vulnerable, but there are those who are more vulnerable. The PWDs, the women, the children, they are, all, they are more vulnerable. The first picture there, that's a girl. She's even called a model. Those legs are protected. We can see how she's suffering there. She's very talkative and she knows what she wants. But she's living in very poor conditions. They live with the mother. This other one here at the middle here. This is a man. Actually, that's the husband to the lady that I have here. The lady was, the guy was normal and working. All of a sudden, he started complaining, complaining, and then he got to be disabled. So, they live with the lady, with the, they have two babies, they live with the woman. The woman has a food kiosk outside the entrance of their place. But then the challenge is maintaining this person. So the lady, when I was talking to the lady, she was telling us, people are pushing me to take this man to, to, to the village, but I'm not. Because when he was healthy, he loved me. We really never got to correct at any time. So I have to take care of him, despite the situation. Now the challenge is, look at his toilet. Whatever he's stepping on, that is his toilet. So the lady must to go help, lift him, place him on that can, and then she goes to the toilet to discard this. The biggest challenge even is of that technology which is, there, which is being used by these people. And there are, there are options that this person can be able to use but they, they don't have this information. When there is planning for sanitation, it's a good thing to think about those people who can really not be able to help themselves, they are very weak. This is another case of a PWD. This lady, 
That actually this girl is called Elena. Elena is 10 years old. This girl, the mother is disabled. Also, it was the same thing like that guy. The lady just got disabled when she was an uh, uh, adult. So when she got this, she's married, she has Elena and another boy. By the time I was meeting her, the son was admitted in Kenyatta Hospital. When they were playing outside, there's, there's the toothpicks. When the children were playing, one used the toothpick to the eye, and then the eye was damaged. So the kid, the kid was in hospital, so she had been left with this girl. But the thing is, she's married. But the husband totally refused to help her address any of her needs and said, we are men. I can't help you do this. Get your relative or your daughter. Unlike the first case when the lady is saying, I love this person, I have to help. This is a different case. So this girl who should be playing will ensure that the feces, the urine, the used parts for the mother have been disposed in the toilet. And then for this community here, the, most of the cases, they associate with witchcraft. And you feel if I use something, this person is using, I might be, it might also get affected. So the toilet they are supposed to be using is normally locked. So that this family don't are not able to access that. So this girl when she goes out to the bucket, she'll just draw on the drainage which is outside because the toilet has been locked. So it's it's like something the community believe in. These people can affect us, so we really don't want them. And they want them to be in the village and not uh, within where they are living. This is now the design I was talking to you about. This is a toilet. You can see the stairs, which are moving up to the toilet. This is a, the toilet starts here. This is where we have the squatting pan. You have to come and climb so that you squat. They do this so that they allow. This is the outlet to, for the feces. So that's how they, that's how they design. So that when you use the toilet, then the waste is washed off. But then the challenge is, think about those girls you've seen who are disabled. Can they use this type of a facility? It is really a very big challenge for them. The, the children who are, in that in, who are in these slums, they are at a very high risk. The ones, there is one player with a stick in the mouth. That's a toilet you cannot even dare look at. I was standing far to check. But the, the boy is just out there and not even thinking that this can affect you. So when we look at this other one who is crossing such a bridge, we can see all the risk which are associated with that. So when we look at all this, there are quite a lot of implications which are there. Right now, we are spending a lot of money on treating sanitation-related illnesses. And not only this uh, treatment of diseases, we are losing a lot of productive years in such. The poverty levels are just getting on and on. That's why I was talking about the more increasing population, the more the issues of uh, poverty. When we consider a population of like 8 million and the waste, managing the waste, the way I've shown you, we can now see how much per day goes out to the environment. But the thing is, uh, the technologies which are there, like my government now have seriously been focusing on conventional sewer systems. Conventional, conventional. It is smart, it is, uh, it's nice, it's every dignity that comes with it. But when you look at figures that have been stated about getting such investment, they are so huge. We expected it to be at 55 dollars per person per year, but now we are only at three. And we are hoping by 20 that you will have done anything. This is just a dream which may not come to reality. My first picture here, this, this is a project which is currently being done. They are installing a simplified sewer in that slum that I will show you about. And then you ask them, do you think this is a solution for these people? No infrastructure to support this. And if you have to do this, and you're not thinking how you even connect the people, where are even the facilities to connect? Because the thing is, I do for you the trunk, and then you connect, you yourself you connect. Have they thought about operation and management? Will this, these people be willing to, to, to sustain this particular sewer? 
So this is a project which is ongoing. We are, we are still to see what will come out of it. But right now, it's in progress. So that's why I'm asking here, which way now we go? We have seen this, the slums we have. Land tenure is an issue. That's no man's land. The owners of those lands are not known. So even investing in such a system in a place where you don't know the owner of this land, it's a big challenge. Because at the end of the day, what do you think would happen if the real owner sometimes showed up? Those are all squatters. There's no one who has titled it. You even never know who the real owner of a plot is in this particular. They are completely unplanned. No toilets except the ones, the type that have shown you there. So there are those who are now trying to put up a system like that. And now the issue here, it's mainly the feces and urine. That's all. That's what you're talking about. So you're asking, which is the best approach? How can this conventional and this innovative integrate? Can they work? Are we going the conventional or we are going the, the innovative? Can we link them so that we can see how they, they will be able to work? Then uh, up to what I have seen in Kenya through the, the many trips I've had in the field, I've realized that there is no one fit solution which can save our country. We need an integration such that the conventional is working hand in hand with the innovative. <coughs> and then also the innovative and meaning, it's not one. Site specific, context specific. One solution, a solution for one place may not be adequate for another place. So it's a thing like asking now, how do we get to have all this? And we are, when we are looking at that, we have to ensure that the solutions are addressing the whole chain. We have the containment, the emptying, the transportation, and the treatment. Can be disposed or reused, that one is okay. And also again, another thing I forgot to put forth about those solutions there, it's like open space. Today I can go to the slum and install toilets. If you give me some $500 today, I can go and put a toilet in the slum. If it's open like that, it leaves the slums to be like dusty bin. Because if you give a toilet and you've not thought about how these people manage this thing, when it is full, it will be nobody's business, it will be left. So when you walk there, you find there are so many things which have just pits. A lot of technologies which are not working most of which are now being put forth by the donors. So if anything has to improve, we have to have some very nice policy that regulates. If you need to get in here and offer a solution, how do you get into that? And also there's the aspect of inclusivity, such that the weakest person can be able to get that, that service. Actually, that is where we should be getting to. That man, that lady, that girl has access to the service that you've gone to provide. This is what I did when I was after my studies here. I wanted to show that something innovative can be able to work. I wanted it to show the concept of containment, emptying, treatment, and reuse. That's what I was gearing towards. To. I normally go for the reuse because I know as like I said, the population is growing, the more food we need. The more food we need, the more our soils are suffering. We are not talking about food security. We are an, uh, a big issue about depriving the soils of the nutrients and we are not returning to them what we get. So we just came up with a, a solution. For, this is an education complex. They were using pit latrines, the area floods. So when it rains, then the sheet is washed off. When it is dry, the, the, the pits sink. So that's how they've been operating. But it's a big challenge because of the diseases that happen within that particular locality. So we just came up with a UDBT, urine diverting gate treating. This is a dry system, no water requirement. It's a dry system, and at least you are always sure the waste is removed on a daily basis. And I also wanted to ensure the aspect of resource recovery to show that it is possible. When I was doing this, it was a big challenge because this is a big education complex. It's in a community where people associate feces with witchcraft. I cannot touch your feces. If, if I meet feces by my doorstep, I'll have to scream. 
Because somebody is really against me. That's the type of community that you are dealing with. We got an entry point, we had this particular system, but we really had to engage the parents. So that we move with them. They had issues. So it is not we did not go to them, it's them who have an issue and they're asking how can we how can you help us address this particular issue? So we sat with them, we explained to them and asked them if they were willing. And then they decided to give it a try. But we ensured that we've moved with them along the way. So we did this. We, we, launched, we launched the facility. The parents were there. We showed them how it was being used. And we showed them where we were taking the feces. When we carry your feces from here, this is where we are taking it, nowhere else. And we assured them you be a university. We are not doing you know, with your feces. So for our, for our facility, which is UDDT. It's so separating. You separate the feces and the urine. Every day, somebody goes and brings these uh, containers to the facility, which are here. They, you just empty and replace with a clean one. They are brought to the treatment facility at the university. And then we use the black soja fly to convert them to protein and some compost, which is a complete system. So when we bring the parents to our room, they start appreciating and saying, ah, you mean this waste can be used to do this particular thing? To run this, we employed women, parents from that particular school, old women. They are the ones who operate. And now they are doing perfect. They are doing very well. So this is, a this is actually, this is now the toilet that we have. That's the toilet that we are using. They were, the, these ones were fabricated by the students. This is our engineering workshops at the university. So the students fabricated and then they were transported for installation. This is how they are normally delivered to our place, to our treatment place at the university. And this is just the room that we are using. The one on that side that uh, shows the building, this is inside. Very simple, just the troughs. Nice troughs arranged. When you just get the waste in here and you introduce your lab, the process just moves on. Initially, when we were doing this, because it was also a very new thing to the university, the staff never wanted to get close because they knew that's a room for human waste. But I can say like today, the lab I produce is never enough because it's only the lab for my chicken. Can you give me lab for my chicken? So depending on the entry, it's possible to change how people view these products that we are produce, recovering from the waste. This is uh, the process in the lab. That's actually, that's just the traps that you have, the waste conversion, that's the lab feeding. And then this is, uh, this is how we do it. of the larvae in the traps. This is where we rear the adults because we need eggs. We have two different rooms. These are the type of cages that we use for to hold for holding the, the adults. We normally have the community. They normally come to see what we are doing. There are some who have already done, started the PSF within the household. We help them. We give them some training and then they are able to access some of the, the eggs for for managing their waste. Some of the products which are normally delayed. I have had quite a number of students doing some research on this, the master's students. There will be quite a number of publications that we are going to, we, which we are expecting for this. So this one was done last year from the lab. We involved people in animal production. We formulated feed for broiler. This is broiler. And then we were comparing with you are checking what's, the, what's, the, what's really enough for the chicken, how much do you need to substitute in the commercial feed. You are comparing with the commercial feed and then different substitutions of the soya bean in commercial feed with the BSF larvae. It is very nice.
that's just a reused chicken, reuse. During that particular period, you were interested in seeing the performance, comparing the, the trials that we had, weight gain, the carcass characteristics, and we also did the Whoever we have here, we normally have even medical doctors who in this particular program. So they want to see the carcass characteristics for the chicken, so they take up such research. We also want to have sensory evaluation. If you're given this and this and this, can you be able to differentiate which tastes better, my meat or this other meat? So whoever we have there, that's a prof in food science who help in managing this, because he's an expert in the field. Um, similarly, at the university, this is just, this one was not even trials, but mainly around the center. The, past, the lady who manages the center never buys tomatoes. She always has five lines of tomatoes that she carries home. We have still students who have done it on experimental basis, and we'll still be having the, re the results after, uh, after the papers are ready. Those are the parents within that particular school. So you really want to tell them that that twist can really do something useful. So when they come there, you tell them, hey, go and pick the chicken you want. And you can see them struggling to get chicken so that they're able to carry home. We also have a fish pond, mud fish, which we just keep for fun because when you go and see the fish jumping up and about, it's really an interesting thing and you know this is a product which has been recovered from waste, so it gives you a lot of joy. So the thing that I would ask is, which I call food for thought, how can we have this innovative solution being integrated into the urban sanitation landscape? How can they work hand in hand? Because one so there's no one fit solution. But still, we need solutions which are safe, which are hygienic, and which are sustainable. How can we be able to ensure that one has been done? So I acknowledge a project, uh, a project which is running, which is supporting all that work that I've been presenting there, which is called Scaling Up of Grid Sanitation. So thank you very much. This is when I'm now feeling my other thing. This is what I really This challenge sanitation challenge is enormous. It's huge. When I was keeping this, it's like 
if they're students, you can really be able to pick on concepts that you want to study all this. They are, like in Kenya, they are complex like this because of priority. You know, it, it depends with what's the government's priority. Is our priority in sanitation? Is our priority in water? It's our priority in roads. Like I was showing you the case of 75% water coverage. That's a very big achievement. Because the person, the government, the person who is there has that priority and is able to push for that to happen. So, what we have in sanitation, especially in our place, sanitation has always been the orphan, no home. It was partly in the Ministry of uh, Health, partly in the Ministry of Water and Sanitation, and partly in the Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources. This change of effort to the environment is by the National Environmental Management Authority, which is under the Ministry of Environment. That's this kind of effort. Sewer systems under the Ministry of Water and Sanitation. These other services are in the public uh, Ministry of Health. So you find when there are so much, when there is all that, there is no coordination. Who do you give money? The Ministry is giving sewers, but the regulation is being done from another side. So it, in our place, it's an issue of what's the priority. If you are able to show, like you are doing here, and pushing this and gatherings like this to show the issue, and then you get the right people in power, it can take a quick to change. But then that depends with how is that aligned? How easy is it to get to those people who are in power so that they can also start thinking? The issue of cartels that we are seeing here, I don't find anything difficult with stopping those cartels, if the government wanted. Look at the issue of the plastic bags in Kenya. They were um, issue a challenge. But when we, there was a it became a priority, it was two months, and you can't use a, a plastic bag. So the issue is, do we have the priority? Do we even have the capacity? We have, there is the priority and also the capacity. Because you might find the people who are in the ministry really are not conversant with any other technologies because they were on conventional, conventional, conventional. So it's like showing them that there are other options which can also be able to work. So like you said, it's a bit complex, but not as complex as we think if there is the will and the priority to do that. Okay, follow up. Okay, so let's say Kenya is really moving at a faster pace and mm -hmm. uh, the neighboring countries, because some of these challenges are common to most African yeah. countries, and they are not performing. Do you think it's has a ripple effect like back home and uh, Kenya, like the progress you people have made, then your neighboring countries are now also pushing hard. Mm -hmm. so does it have some way that it will go back and affect your people? And if it does, what are the countries like interconnection? What are they doing so that the movement will be a whole and not like a single country that is pushing for the sanitation agenda? I think I can say, when we talk about water and sanitation, there's a whole difference. Water, we talk, water is life. If I lack water, it's possible to die. So water is not my issue. I can ask you, give me water. That's water, give me water. If today I want, if I, I have my needs here, I will start now squeezing. I don't want even anybody to know that see, I have an issue. Sanitation and my waste is my thing. That's how we've held it. Sanitation is your issue. What is not an issue? Uh, it's not, what is not my issue, it is our issue. In Kenya, if you, even in these particular places, if there is no water for some time, they will riot. We need water. We need water. Because they know they need water. They are empowered to know that they need water. But sanitation, even if you left your toilet blocked in the house, you don't want people to know that your toilet in the house is blocked. It's associated with that. It is dirty. You see? So not unless we get people who can talk shit. When you meet people, you're talking it, you are calling it by name. When I started this at the university, if you even tell a person this is feces, it's like, ah, huh? are you mad? How dare you mention feces? You see? It's not a bad thing, but you've been cultured to believe. They are our issues. And that is what is happening in the countries that we are living there. I only 
hope that one country can step forward and move because the wave will flow in the other countries. If you are able to cause change in the country, even in the country like I'm talking about here, I have a, I mean, Meru County, Kenya, we have got seven counties and Meru. If today we, I can work the county, we make everything nice. The other counties will come to benchmark. They don't want to change. You see? So you start somewhere for people to see it is possible because people don't know that these things are possible. If people see these things are possible, then they can be able to move and also start doing that. So this one is a challenge. Not only in East Africa, this is a global challenge. But this is the Kenyan case. If you went to your country and you explored, this is exactly what you find out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please. Yes. My name is Irene from Kenya. Uh, I'm glad that you talked about this and featuring on uh, informal settlements. I'm doing something similar for my research, but on the water section. Mm -hmm. So it's good that you mentioned about the conventional ways and the innovative ways. I find that in the informal settlements, there are so many innovations that have been put in place. And uh, yeah, from time for a long time. Mm -hmm. I find that this these innovations or these interventions are not working because the conventional methods are, uh, are also not suitable for these areas because they need like situated, they are situated areas, they need specific solutions, not like the other areas. So what do you think is the problem? Why are they not working? This kind of innovation. Thank you, thank you very much for that. Like I said, there is no one fit solution. The convention must run hand in hand with the innovative. There's a sewer system that I was showing which is being done now. I'm waiting to see if it will work. Because most probably it will not work. It needs a lot of infrastructure to support that trunk that has been put forth. When you go to the to the slums, like what we have wherever we're working, you find there are very many solutions. The government of the there are so many things which have been put. But what you have to understand is this is money, you get a grant. You want to go and put, manage feces in Kibera. You are given money, you go and put a toilet block and you go away. Who did you leave that to manage? Who did you leave it for? Then if it's water, you go and give them your tap there. Who have you left that tap for? So you find it's like free market. You can go with everything and dump there. It's like some place to dump. I, how I wish that it can be, there can be a, a department in a ministry to control the entry of all these things to the slum. Such that if I go with my solution today and say this is what I want to do, maybe in Meru, I am with the county government. For one, they'll take it up after I leave. So that they'll ensure that it is sustainable. Or you have an arrangement such that the county will ensure that to push you to do what you say to do. Other than it being free, you can do it and go away. That's why you find there's so many things which are there, but instead of helping, they are creating more problems. The problems which are mainly here are created. They are created. The landlords who are here, you do, you do your house, your rooms, you have 20 rooms, and you don't provide any toilet. Should you be allowed to do like that? What if there was a law that said, if you have to do this, if you have to be a landlord, you must provide ABCD. So if we had, uh, if our institutional frameworks were strong, they would be able to bridge some of the gaps that are there. Some of them are just non-made, they, they are just created. It, I, I feel it's good if this, you don't offer this solution other than offering it for two weeks and, and then you go. We have two extra questions here, too, so that's perfect. Thank you so much. I'm doing for the good presentation. I'm Gita, also from Kenya. And you know that uh, the, 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 the Kenyan government, uh, or the, the Kenyan's country there is that's uh, evolving. We have the county government and the national government. And they are working in collaboration to see uh, changes in infrastructure sanitation and water. And uh, without further mm -hmm. prediction, I would like to say that. If I'm saying that sanitation and water are not somehow uh, 
sanitization. You can't talk about sanitation and live water. So I think we are uh, running concurrently. And uh, uh, with the new government, the government has uh, all have a plan for the cleaning up rivers and the installation of uh, water water things. So do you know the uh, do you have a clear estimation of government uh, contribution or government estimate to carry out the sanitation? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that. It's very true, you can't talk water without sanitation. If you talk water, if you focus on water, you leave sanitation, you're failed. That's all I was saying. We have water, there's water which is there, but if you contaminate it, then you're not providing any solution. So if I have to push the water coverage to 65, sanitation must also be about there. So that we have systems with infrastructure that can be able to take out the waste and treat it well. So like I was giving, I gave a figure year of 65% for water in Nairobi. I was informed that by the end of 2023, the projects which are ongoing will push that to 75%. But currently in Nairobi we have 65%. Sanitation is at 27%. If the projects which are there are complete, it will be at 35%. But that is in books. We are yet to see when. Because they said it will depend with availability of funding. That's what they said. And again, when you look at the, the water utilities that we have in Kenya, like I'm in Meru Water and Sanitation Company. If you ask them what do they really mean they do, most of the counties have no treatment. They have, they supply water, clean water, but then they don't have this other aspect. So if you were to ask about how the waste from these counties are managed, how is it managed? It's a water and sanitation company. You must ensure you've provided water to your citizens and also you've provided sanitation to your citizens. So the main thing, our main issue is, we are so much leaning on one side and ignoring the other side. But when you lean more on one side, this other side will come and spoil your day. It will contaminate what the efforts will not succeed. Mm -hmm. Was there a question here? No, I think it's pretty good. Yes. Okay, so we need to we don't have much time for another question, so I would like to thank you very much, Shoy, for this presentation. Thank you. That I hope that we will have the recorded version so extra persons can see it at IG Delft. And thank you all of you for attending this nice uh, session. Thank you very much, Roy. Thank you. Thank you.